Hallelujah. Glory. God be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God, we worship you. We magnify your great name, O oh God. We exalt you. We give you glory. We give you honor. We give you praise. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. My God. My God. Wonderful Savior. God bless you, Dennis. Thank you for joining tonight. Praise the Lord, my brother, for your presence. Hallelujah. We're going to get started in just a moment. Just doing a little something here. Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, all right. Well, praise the Lord again, for God is good, his mercy endures forever. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. <clears throat> God is so good. We praise his name for another wonderful day he has created. Amen. So let's open up in a word of prayer. Go ahead and do that. So Father God, in the name of Jesus, God, I give you praise. I give you glory. I give you honor. I thank you, Lord God, for the opportunity to share your word tonight, O oh God. I ask that you speak to our hearts by divine revelation from the Holy Spirit, O oh God. Give us insight. Give us understanding. Give us knowledge. Give us wisdom. Help us to grow in grace and in the knowledge of who you are. We exalt the Lord, O oh God. We worship at your footstool, O oh God. We magnify your great name. We ask, O oh God, that you forgive us for our sins. Knowing and knowingly, Father God, cleanse our minds, our heart. Remove the busyness of the day from us, O oh God. We have nothing to hinder us from receiving your word tonight, O oh God. Father, we thank you as Jesus declared in your word that man should not live by bread alone, but every word proceeds out of the mouth of God. Help us to have a hunger and a thirst for righteousness that only you can feel and satisfy. And I thank you, O oh God, for every person that hear this word tonight, even those who may hear it later on, Father God, that you bless their hearts tremendously, O oh God. Cause this word to be enriching to their souls that will help change their lives forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I pray the word of God will heal and deliver many to hear this word that will set them free in their inner man. Truly, God is good. His mercy endures forever. Last week, we were talking about critical deception. We were referring to how many people in the body of Christ become deceived by themselves or they allow others to manipulate them, to leave in the church, or different things happen. And we have to really be aware of the enemy's tactics because they come in many forms and many ways to hinder and distract you from your purpose and the destiny God has for you. Even when it comes to dealing with um, crooked pastors, if you're in a house of God, a place that God set you to be, and you feel God led you to that place, it's your responsibility to pray for your leader. There's no perfect pastor, no perfect leader. And it's our responsibility to pray for them that God would use them for his glory. No matter what they go through in their lives, we all have troubles, we all have trials, we all have tests. But no matter where they come from, we must stand in victory and faith, believing that God will cause them to have the ability to overcome. It's very important as a child of God to encourage your leaders. Keep standing on the word of truth. So many times people want to define you by your issue. They want to define you by your issue. And you read throughout the Old Testament, you find out that there were many people that had issues. Even in the New Testament, Paul addressed many, many churches with issues in order to bring correction, to bring reproof, to bring enlightenment. 
from the word of God. He spoke nothing but truth to help change their lives. And it's very important for us as the believers, the children of God, to allow the Holy Spirit to come into your heart, to convict you of sin, and change your mind that your life would change. So important. We talked about a story about a pastor who was um, knew about another pastor who was uh, not walking in his calling that we got one to be and had some issues in his life and folks began to spread gossip about this leader and want to define the leader by his issues and try to get people to leave the church. If you're in a place and you know things are going on in that church, if God didn't tell you to leave, you better not leave because you're out of order. If God sets you in a place where you are designed and appointed by the Spirit of God to be, you need to serve under the ministry the full capacity of all your strength that God has given you for the glory of God. Not for the glory of man, but for the glory of God. And when you do that, the Spirit of God will continue to build you up. Spirit of God will strengthen you. Spirit of God will cause you to begin to intercede on behalf of those who are weak, but the weak will become strong in the presence of the Lord. And a lot of times, we blame other people for our faults. We don't want to face our own issues, but I'm quick to point out your issues. I'm quick to point out your problems in your life, in the life of your family, in the life of your children, but I'm not quick to point out my own faults and acknowledge that I have an issue. And that's one thing about the Bible. It talks about hypocrites because we have a hypocritical mindset or I'm quick to judge somebody else for their actions or wrongdoings, but when it comes to myself, I omit it. And that's why a lot of times we pray for the Lord, forgive our sins, knowing unknowingly, because sometimes we do things we know about, and there are things we do we don't know about. And God is saying, you need to get in the place where you humble yourself, recognize your faults, repent. When you repent, the Holy Spirit allows the blood of Jesus to cleanse you from all sin. So we got to walk in truth and righteousness every day of our lives. This Facebook thing is really starting to irritate me. Has some pop-up screens. Keep talking about the bandwidth is too low. And I need to change it. I don't know how to change it. So if someone know how to do that, please let me know. Because this is very annoying. I'm having to keep closing this, these two screens that keep popping up. But tonight we're going to continue in our lesson um, the bait of Satan, living free from deadly trust offense. We talked about in the same chapter how spiritual vagabonds are born. How spiritual vagabonds are born. And spiritual vag vagabonds, as we define, is a wanderer. It's a person who's a beggar. Never settle. Never find rest. Never have peace. Always messy. Always trying to find faults in others, not themselves. However, the subject tonight, it says in the same chapter, the planted flourish. The planted flourish. And when you think about planted, when I think about the word planted, I think about a seed. Because if I want to have a garden, I must first prepare the soil. I must then till the soil, take up debris from the soil, remove all the stuff that might obscure this, this garden from coming forth, to be flourishing, and then plant the seeds. And once I plant the seeds, the Holy Spirit will water that seed and cause that seed to begin to multiply and bring forth an abundance of whatever God is trying to grow in our lives. Some might need to grow in their patience. Some might need to grow in their love. Some might even need to grow in compassion, in forgiveness. Because there are so many issues we deal with that we try to omit and hide under the rug until somebody push your button and cause you get out of character. And when you get out of character, now you have a sorrowful heart or you get into a place of bitterness because many offenses is a bait from Satan 
to pull you out of your position in Christ, to cause you to act out according to the dictates of the flesh, that the flesh would dominate your mindset. When it dominates your mindset, it controls your actions. Think about it. Whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if I think myself to be aggressive, to be a person of retaliation, mean and bitter, those begin to become my responses to other people. I respond to whatever attitude I have inside myself. And if I allow the enemy to manipulate me, that's exactly what he's going to do is cause me to sin against God. And the Lord is saying tonight, be careful who you entertain, what you watch on television, what you, what you hear on the radios, because those things send forth subliminal messages. People would give you subliminal messages because they're messy. Messy people look for a foothold in your life to destroy your life or the life of somebody else. We talked about tail bearers last week because that's exactly what the enemy would do is cause you to become a tail bearer. And a tail bearer is a person who's a gossiper, a person who continues to spread rumors, always trying to cause some type of friction to bring some interruption in the plan of God in somebody's life. And you have to be aware of the enemy's tactic because that's what he's looking for is to destroy your character. I was reading a book several years ago. It's called Lord Help Me. Lord Help Me Break This Habit. Lord Help Me Break This Habit. And it's by this person here, Quinn Sure and Ruth Ann Garlock. And in this book, is some very vital points to make you think about your behavior. It calls you to think about your actions and your responses. I was reading a certain passage in here last night, and I read it again today, and it says, make, making right choices, making right choices. And when you realize the deadly traps of offense is determined by your choice. You hear what I just said? The daily traps of offense only can activate in your life by your choice. You can choose life or choose death. It's up to you to make the responsibility a righteous reaction to the things the enemy brings at you. We need to learn to be proactive. God told me this a few weeks ago. We need to learn to be proactive when it comes to dealing with the enemy. Proactive means I'm going to consecrate. I'm going to study the word of God. I'm going to spend time in the presence of the Lord. Doing what God wants me to do the most to glorify him. And my choice. So when the enemy does come with temptations knocking at my door. I can tell him return to sender because I'm not choosing today to entertain your devices or your, your infiltration of, of deadly traps. You have to make a decision in yourself when the enemy mails you a package and says, this is for you. Anything the enemy brings to you may appear to be good. It even sounds good. You got folks who come to you with gossip. They come to you with a rumor about somebody else's situations. They might be in a broken marriage. They might have some confusion going on with their children. Somebody might got a disease. It doesn't matter what it is. They're going to come to you with a mess that sounds juicy. And hoping you'll gravitate or be baited by what they're giving you. You gravitate to it and go share it with somebody else. We talked about last week, let me go back to this one point. It said in the book, it says Proverbs 26 chapter verse 20. Proverbs 26 chapter verse 20. Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Have you tried building a bonfire? And the more you put stuff in that fire, 
the larger it becomes, the more intense the heat becomes. Why? Because you're feeding fuel to the fire. And the scripture tells us in wisdom, where there is no wood, the fire goes out. And where there is no tail bearer, strife ceases. So if I don't feed the fire, just because you might bring some garbage to me, doesn't mean I have to receive it. So I have a choice to listen with my ear gates, all the mess you're feeding me, gravitate to it and go spread it. Or, as just like the word says here, where there's no wood, so I can take the stuff that will fuel the fire and cast it in the fire of the Holy Ghost and allow it to be burned up. And don't entertain the garbage I just received. So the Holy Ghost comes in and he cleanses you from a dead conscience, a sinful conscience. And he takes away the things the enemy uses against you to keep you messy, to keep you in a spirit of a vagabond. Because the spirit of a vagabond becomes a tail bearer. They love strife. They love friction. They love confusion. They love fighting. They love gossip. They love backbiting. They love slandering people. They love breaking you down to make you miserable. The spirit of the vagabond is an empty, deceitful spirit that comes against you to destroy you. My God. My God, my God, my God. I hope this is helping somebody. Because we have to be aware of the spirit of the enemy of a vagabond. Jesus gave us the spirit of reconciliation. And when you have been born again, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17, said, therefore, if any man be in Christ Jesus, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. Why? Because an exchange factor took place the moment I say, here I am, Lord, I surrender, come into my heart, be my Lord and Savior. Jesus comes in, the old man goes out. You know what I said? The exchange factor. The new man comes in, the old man goes out. So that means the old attitudes, that sinful lifestyle, it goes out the body by the Spirit of the living God. So the new man comes in, which includes the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Read Galatians chapter 5, the whole chapter. It talks about the flesh. And it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. Because there's a war every day inside of us as a child of God to lure you back to the things you've been delivered from. And the enemy knows if I can entrap you, I can bait you, I can lead you astray back into the old habits, the old stronghold, the old lies he spoke to you, and get you entrapped in a place of darkness. And God is saying tonight, don't allow the enemy to get you trapped in a dark place. In that dark place is an empty place, is a barren place, is a place of misery, is a place of pain, a place of hurt, a, a place where you don't find no hope. And God is saying tonight, don't allow the enemy to victimize you to become a tail bearer. I'm going to read something in this book. Lord, help me break this habit. Lord, help me break this habit. And it says, making right choices. Making right choices. And it says, making right choices. Yes, we do myriads of things we really hate. Listen to me now. We do myriads or countless amount of things we hate. We do it anyway. Paul had that problem in Romans chapter 7. Read Romans chapter 7, the latter part of that chapter. He talks about the very same thing. How the good I should do, I don't do, and the things I shouldn't do, I do. And he says, two laws were to me, law of sin and law of God. So we got to recognize there's going to always be a constant battle inside of you. We talked about the battlefield of the mind um, many months ago 
because that's a battle every day of my life that's between God's righteousness and the enemy's unrighteousness. And you have to make a decision, a decisive, a wise decision to choose to live in righteousness. And it says, to name a few, criticism, complaining, worry, pride, envy, anger, gossip, failure to forgive, self-reliance, that's that pride, that selfishness, failure to care for our bodies, neg neglecting our families, indulging in harmful habits. So all these characteristics are what? The attributes of the flesh. The things that we should hate as a child of God. But instead of hating those things, we play around with it. You ever been in a, in a situation where you're being tempted to do something you've been delivered from? He said, no, I ain't going to indulge in that. I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to drink. I'm not going to do no drugs. Even though you're hanging around a crowd that's doing those things, I'm not going to fornicate. I'm not going to adulterate. I'm not going to get prideful. But you're hanging around people with that same behavior pattern. Corrupt communication, corrupt good manners. So if I hang around unrighteousness long enough, that spirit that's baiting me is going to pull me in. Slowly, slowly going to gravitate. I'm going to start gravitating to the things I hate. I'm going to start coming to it and getting closer and closer to the gospel and trap in the, in the prison. Just like you hear around thief. You hang around thief long enough, you're going to steal. And the consequences, if you get caught, what happens? You go to jail. Why? Because you stole something that wasn't yours. The enemy does the same thing. He tries to bait you to steal you away from God's righteousness to a place of unrighteousness, a place of darkness and rebellion and selfish pride. So all the things he wants you to do are the actions of rebellion. Then he goes and says, we know these attitudes and actions are wrong. We know they're wrong. You know you shouldn't be hanging around certain people. You know you're not strong enough to handle it. When temptation comes, if you know you're not strong enough to deal with the issue at hand, you need to flee all manner of evil. Run. Get away from them. Cut them off. Don't answer the phone. Don't call them. When you feel weak and vulnerable, don't call your temptation. We do it all the time. We we'll call the people we know that mean us no good and we want to hang around them anyway. And then we go and say, God, forgive me. I messed up. God knew you're going to mess up. The reason why he said, shun the very presence of evil. If I don't shun the very presence of evil, when evil comes to me and presents the offering before me to, to bait me, guess what I'm doing? I'm slapping God in the face, saying your grace ain't good enough for me. Because the grace of God, we talked about this before, appear unto all men, teaching us to deny all godly lust and worldly sin before God and man. The grace of God is God's provision, his power, his ability to keep you when you can't keep yourself. He draws you by the spirit of the living God when you're just about at the verge of slipping, going down a pot of water, going to whole chunk casino, when you're just about to slip. The Holy Ghost said, nope, don't you do that. You need to go the other direction. Matter of fact, once you give that money, you're about to give that down to the church. But instead of giving it to the church, I go find other reasons to spend my money and sin, sin, on sin for myself. So we have to be careful when the enemy comes knocking at your door to bait you to fall into temptation, trials and tests, and allow the Holy Spirit to cleanse your mind and your heart. Then it goes on. It says, yet we often seem helpless to change because 
I indulge so much in the wrong behaviors, it seems helpless to change. So it becomes difficult. It becomes hard. I struggle to change. You know what? Just this past um, weekend, I was on TikTok, I was on Instagram, and the Holy Spirit said, shut it down. Because I have never seen so many women and men exposing their body on, on TikTok and Instagram. Everybody wants to show you their goods. And every time you flip through it, you keep running to the same old stuff, but different people. Follow me with this one. The same sin, different method. The same sin, different methods. So it's different people with the same sin to entice you to lust. And I found myself having a spirit of lust. And the Holy Ghost said, what are you doing? <coughs> he said, cut it off. Because anything, I'm going to say this to everybody, anything in your life, that promotes you to lust after the things of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, to get into a place of rebellion, is not from God. It's a bait from Satan. And you got to have enough sense within yourself to realize, in my own strength, I'm helpless. I can't fight this. I can't overcome this. But when you hear the spirit of the living God, and he tells you, you out of order, you need to stop it. You need to turn your eyes from that. Don't look at that stuff. Don't look at pornography. Don't go to drugs. Don't go drinking. Don't do this. Don't do that. You need to stop it. Why? Because he said those who know to do right, they're going to be beaten with, with many stripes. But them that knew not to do right, a few stripes. So we know what's wrong, but because we've done it so long, we find what well, God ain't, God is gonna have mercy on me. God gonna He gonna forgive me if I repent. So a little bit of this stuff ain't gonna hurt. And the Holy Ghost says, a little leaven, a little sin, corrupts the whole thing. You give a little sin, that little sin, to like Satan. Oh, he needs a foothold. The Bible says neither can place the devil nor, nor entertain him. Don't even give him a foothold. Cause he get a foothold. He comes in your life and he takes control of you. And before you know it, you're done backslid. Now you're in backslid. You got out there in a place you didn't need to be. And you're staying longer than you intended to stay. And the Holy Ghost keep pricking your heart. Keep convicting you. But because you've done it so long, you're stuck. And now you're starting to look like you're stuck. You're starting to smell like you're stuck. And everything you're doing is magnifying the sin in your life to make you get further and further away from God. Look at the story of the prodigal son, Luke chapter 15. Prodigal son, with his father, give me my portion of my inheritance. He went and, and did what he wanted to do, lived a righteous life, and, and began to party, do what he wanted to do, spend all his money. And when all the money gone, all his friends were gone. When you get to the place what part is seems good. You get all these people that's with you, as long as you got something for them. But once the well dries, where they at? Where are the ones that were with you when the well dry? They abandoned you. Come in and need you no good in the first place. They were using you. And the Holy Ghost says tonight, stop allowing yourself to be vulnerable. To get into a place where the enemy can use you. To pull you from your purpose from your destiny, from the plan God has for your life. Then he goes and says, which raises the question, why do we do the things we hate? The Bible is our guidebook for finding answers. You need an answer to your situation, to your problem, to your illness. Go to the Bible. There's an answer. In God's word for every situation, every temptation that you face. It's a word in God's book just for you. It's tailor-made. Check this out. Satan has tailor-made sins just for you. God has tailor-made word just for you. 
And the word is designed to meet you just when you need it the most. But you got to be willing to open up your gate, open up your heart, receive it. Tell God, here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that you're my God and I need you, God. And guess what? He comes in like a mighty rushing wind. The Lord comes in and raises a standard. Oh, my God. <laughs> against the enemy in your life. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they made an irreversible choice. When Adam and Eve sinned in the garden, they made an irreversible choice. They couldn't change it. Thank God for Jesus. What, what if God, think about this. You got a bad habit. You got a negative attitude. You're selfish. You're stingy. You're always doing stuff. To peace yourself. What if God decided, I'm going to take my grace from them. I'm going to let them go on and live the life they want to live. I'm not going to deliver them. I'm not going to hear their prayers. As a matter of fact, I'm going to turn my back on them and let them die in their sin. What a miserable state to be in when God turns his back on you and said, you know what? You messed up too much. I ain't got time for you anymore. Matter of fact, I'm just going to let you go. Adam and Eve made the choice that was irreversible. Couldn't even go back on their words and say, God, I made a mistake. Forgive me. Instead, they made an excuse. God had given them only one restriction. They were not to eat from the tree of good and evil. Read Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. Genesis chapter 2, verse 15 through 17. But they listened to the voice of temptation and chose to disobey. My God, my God. You know why we messed up today? All because of this right here. What I just read in the book. Because they made an irreversible choice to rebel against God, to disobey God. How many times have you disobeyed God? When you know you heard God tell you to do something that you should have done. And you didn't do it. When God told you to go pray for somebody, you didn't want to do it because you didn't, you didn't like the attitude. When God told you, go lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover. But because your attitude was messed up, I don't like the way they, they, they smell. I don't like the way they look. I don't like what they're doing in their life. It ain't about you. It's about obedience. Your obedience. I remember uh, watching that movie um, with uh, Morgan Freeman. Uh, what, is, uh, uh, what is it called? Uh, Bruce Almighty, and, and how he, he was like, wanted to be God, because he felt like he could do God better than God can do. So he gave him, gave him the responsibility. And then Evan Almighty, and Evan Almighty, he said one random act of kindness. One random act of kindness will help change somebody's life. And, and those two movies have a very spiritual meaning in them, if you pay attention. Bruce Almighty and Evan Almighty. And they both have a message to remind you of your re responsibility to rely on God. And, and, and the thing with Adam and Eve, because they chose to disobey, because all humankind has inherited their sinful nature, our nat natural tendencies is to make the wrong choices too. We inherited the DNA from their nature of sin. We inherited the disobedience spirit from their sin. And because of that, we all suffer. Until Jesus, our propitiation, who took the wrath of God from us and took it upon himself and became the atoning sacrifice for our sins, he redeemed our lives, hallelujah, from sin and iniquity and gave us salvation. However, from the beginning, God had a plan to redeem us by sending Jesus to pay the penalty for our sins. Today, even after receiving Christ as our Savior, we daily face the choice of whether to follow God's way or walk in our own way. Even after receiving Christ as your Lord and Savior, you still have responsibility to make a choice. If you're going to walk in your own self-indulgence of your flesh, or you're going to walk in submissiveness and humility to the Holy Spirit, leadership unto God. It's your choice. 
Sometimes we experience a struggle of conscience over doing what we know we need to do is right. So we have a conscience, but we struggle with the conscience of God. The righteous conscience says keep doing what's right. The sinful conscience tells you, no, nah, you're going to and, and do what you want to do to make yourself happy. Because the more I satisfy my flesh, the less I give influence to God. And so there's a battle that's going to continue to have its influence in your life until you submit. When you submit, it doesn't matter how much the devil tempt me, no matter how much he send people around me to entice me, I'm not going to be in a battle. I'll be like the tree planted in the house of God that will flourish in my season because I'm not going to bow. And then it goes on. It says, sometimes we experience a struggle of conscience over doing what we know is right. Yet the more we learn about Jesus, who he is, and what he has provided for us, the more we should want to choose his ways and reflect his identity. We need to want to have a desire, a lifestyle that's going to mimic, going to exemplify the identity of Jesus Christ in your life. So when people see you, no matter how many times they know you make mistakes, fall into the same old entrapments to mess up, and they see you walking up right before God and walking in integrity, walking in truth, your character's line the word of God. Even though they say, well, I know what you used to do. I know what you used to be. You used to hang over here in the club. You used to go over here to this so-and-so house for the parties all the time. But I'm a changed person because the Holy Ghost took over my life. I'm born again. I feel the Holy Ghost. Even though they don't want to believe it, my actions will exemplify Christ when they see it for themselves. I don't have to argue with nobody. I don't have to beg to believe who I am. I don't have to do anything to manipulate nobody to believe who I am. But be myself. And everybody knows me, I always be myself. I don't try to be judgmental of nobody. I don't try to put nobody else down because I feel like I'm better than they are. I don't try to get puffed up and haughty because I think I know more than anybody else. I practice every day to walk in submissiveness to the Holy Spirit leadership unto God that my life will be an outward expression of the love of God for all mankind. It is important to remember that we do not need to work to earn God's approval. He already loves us and accepts us because he sees us forgiven through the redemptive work of Christ. But yielding our will to his and allowing the Holy Spirit to guide and strengthen us, making the right choice pleases God. So when I learn how to yield, let the Holy Spirit lead me, guess what? God is pleased with that. He loves me. Go to Psalms 92, verse 13. The planted flourish, the planted flourish. Psalms 92, verse 13. It says, the righteous shall flourish like the palm tree. He shall grow like the cedar in Lebanon. If you know the trees, if you look up these trees in Lebanon, there's some strong trees, some tall trees. Those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. Verse 14, they shall still bring forth fruit in old age. They shall be fat and flourishing. And that word fat is not talking about just being overweight. It's talking about being, being abundant in the spirit. Flourishing in the anointing. Because when you get in the anointing, you get in God's word, God's word get inside of you, he said you're going to flourish. So I just read Psalm 92, verse 13 through 14. I mean, verse 12 to 14. 12 to 14. And it talks about flourishing. And that's what God wants us every day of our life, to flourish. Notice that those who flourish are planted in the house of the Lord. What happens to a plant if you transplant it every three weeks. Most of you know that his root system will diminish. It will not blossom or prosper. Right? 
Think about it. If you got a plant, a real plant, not a fake plant, you got a real plant, and you every three weeks decide I'm going to take this plant out of the dirt and replant it again. Then in three weeks later, I'm going to take it out of the dirt, replant it again. That plant is going to go into a state of shock and the roots going to start breaking off. Why? Because it's not getting enough substance to sustain it, to flourish. That's a message right there for somebody. The more you keep allowing the enemy to uproot you from being planted in the house of the Lord and a church God wants you to be, you will never flourish because your roots are not being rooted and grounded. It's not being planted where God wants to be to draw the substance to cause it to flourish. My God, my God, my God. It will not blossom. If you keep transplanting it, check this out. If you keep transplanting it, the plant will die of shock. You have a lot of folk went from church to church because I don't like this church. We talked about last week how we try to make the church a buffet. We pick and choose what I want on the buffet. If you go to old, old, go, old, old, what, old country buffet or Golden Corral, you go to any one of those places, you have a choice on the meat section, the vegetable section, the dessert section, the fruit section, the salad bar. You have a choice to pick and choose what you want from the buffet. I done paid my money. I have the right to go get what I want, eat what I want, as much as I want. I can get fat from what I want because it's my choice. In the house of God, God says, if you've been planted in the house of the Lord, you need to maintain that your fruit will remain. You cannot bear fruit in the kingdom of God constantly being uprooted. You got a lot of folk pick and choose in the church what I don't like and what I like, and they leave that church, go to another church looking for a perfect church. Deceiving themselves, not being wise. The word tells us, be careful he who thinks he stands, lest he fall. Why? Because I'm constantly moving from place to place to place, never being planted. How am I going to grow in the kingdom of God? So I begin to get into a place of spiritual shock. The sin takes over. I began to spiritually die. He would just say it. You get into a place of spiritually being shocked because you've been uprooted too much. The substance that is there to sustain you is not there anymore because you've become desensitized to the things of God till it doesn't even affect you anymore. So now I'm starting to spiritually die and the enemy is, is glad about it. He's rejoicing over it because now I got you. I'm pulling you out of the hand of God. So you begin to spiritually die until there's no more substance to maintain a spiritual life in Christ Jesus. The sin overpowers you. You get into a dark place. You get into a spiritual prison. Satan got you locked down. And no matter what you do, everything falls apart in your life. The enemy makes sin look good. He glorifies sin. And he makes it look appealing to the eyes, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. He wants to look good to your eyes, so your eyes will be gravitated to it. And once he gets you, well, I can get you gays like a, a, a cobra. You ever seen the show with the cobra snakes? They know how to captivate you by their eyes. You look into the eyes of a cobra. He mesmerizes you. He puts you in a trance. And when you get in that trance, is a place of vulnerability where now I can bite you. Satan does the same thing. He leads God's people to a place of a spiritual trance. We can get you vulnerable, helpless, useless. Then he begins to bite you and breathe the poison inside of you to destroy you. You need to be careful. You need to be prayed up. You need to be on guard. You need to be alert. 
You need to be sober in your spirit. So when the enemy does come in like a flood, you sense God's presence coming in to rescue you. Many people go from church to church, ministry team to ministry teams, trying to develop their ministry. If God puts them in a place where they are not, not recognized they, they, and encouraged, they easily become offended. If they don't agree with the way something is done, they often are offended and go. They then leave blaming the leadership. They are blind to any of their own character flaws and do not realize God wanted to refine and mature them through the pressure. Check this out. Through the pressure, the squeezing they were under. Sometimes God puts you in a place for pressure for a reason. To squeeze the mess out of you. If God doesn't shake us and pressure us sometimes, we'll never repent. We'll always find ourselves making excuses to cover up our sins. Sometimes God will put you in the fire. We talked about this last week. God will sometimes allow you to get into a heated argument, get into a heated place, a place of confusion, to see what your response is going to be. He'll let you get in the fire to deliver you in the fire, not outside the fire, but in the fire. So we got to learn from observation. Recognize these spirits when they come before you that's not of God. Let's learn from the examples God gives with plants and trees. When a fruit tree is, is put in the ground, it has to face the rainstorms, the hot sun, and the wind. Right? The Florida orange trees have to go through a frost season. Got to go through the hurricane. Got to go through many different challenges. If a young tree could talk, it might say, please get me out of here. Put me in a place where there's no, no sweltering heat or windy storms. If the gardener listened to the trees, he would actually harm the tree. Trees endure hot suns and rainstorms by sending their roots down deeper. I love this point. This was so powerful when I read this. I said, oh my God, how, how, what, what if we did the same thing? When the pressure comes, the storms of life come, the hot discussions come, the, the wind storms come, and instead of giving up and fighting flesh with flesh, I go into the spirit. Take my roots deeper in the anointing. And you might ask the question, how do I do this? How do I take my, my roots deeper in, in, in the anointing? Because when the enemy comes to you, with the tests and the trials and tribulations, instead of buckling under the pressure, I indulge in the word. I dive in the river of the anointing. I go deeper in God. I consecrate. I seek his faith until I get an answer how to deal with the situation. And many times, I talked about this last week, my silence becomes the greatest weapon against the enemy. The enemy can't see where you're coming. He don't know where you're going because I'm silent. You don't have to always defend yourself when people come to you in hostility. You don't have to always have an answer for somebody who's argumental. You have to learn to go deep in the river of the anointing and let the Lord fight your battle. The more you put yourself in it, the more Confucius and chaotic it becomes. You have to learn how to shut your mouth sometime and go into the spirit. Begin to pray in tongues. If you know how to pray in tongues, just start praying. Many times I was tested. Many times I was provoked to fight. Many times I was in hostility. And I learned how to shut my mouth. And I allow the Lord to calm my spirit through the anointing. And the anointing gave me wisdom how to deal with my opposing forces. And guess what? He'll do the same thing for you. If you learn how to shut up sometime, let the Lord fight your battle, read Proverbs. Proverbs, the book of wisdom. 
Proverbs deal with every area of life. And when you begin to read the Proverbs, the Proverbs begin to read you. Because they're going to show you your heart. It defines your heart. It, it pricks your heart. It convicts your heart on how you are to behave and respond with any situation in life. The harshness of the elements surrounding them causes them to seek another source of life. They will one day come to a place that even the greatest windstorm cannot affect their ability to produce fruit. And that is so good. So good. Because the more I give into the Spirit, allow the Holy Ghost to speak to me, God gives me wisdom how to deal with every situation that, that comes into my life. Several years ago, I lived in Florida, a citrus capital. Most of Florida, Floridians know the colder, the colder the winter is for the trees, the sweeter the oranges. Ain't that something? The colder the winter is, the sweeter the oranges. That, that don't even make sense. That lets you know there's God in heaven. Because God designed for his nature creations to respond according to his word. If we did not run so fast from spiritual resistance, our root systems would have a chance to become stronger and deeper. And our fruit would be plentiful and sweeter in the eyes of God and more palatable to his people. We would be mature trees that the Lord delights in rather than ones uprooted for lack of fruit. Read St. Luke chapter 13. St. Luke chapter 13, verse 6 through 9. It's talking about the sower. St. Luke chapter 13, verse 6 through 9. We should not resist everything God sends to mature us. We should not resist everything God sends to us to mature us. We should not resist everything God allows to happen in your life to mature you. But allow the Spirit of God to cause you to grow. Many times, if I don't understand certain things, we want to give up. Because I don't understand why people are responding to me, why they treat me where they are, on a job they might be, be overlooking you for promotions, they might be overlooking you and, and mistreating you on the job because they don't like who you are or the way you dress, the way you talk, the way you look. Folks have various reasons to not like you and they their own pre preconceived ideas. And everything they're thinking about may, ne may not necessarily be true. But because of the minds of the flesh, it's an enemy of God, they're going to find any type of fault to have against you as a child of God. The psalmist David, inspired, the Holy, inspired by the Holy Ghost, made a powerful connection between offense, the law of God, and the, our spiritual growth. He wrote in Psalms 1, Bless the man that walks not in the counsel of God and sin the seed of scornful, who delights in the law of the Lord, and his law does he meditate day and night. Psalms chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Psalms chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. Then in Psalms 119, verse 65, he gave us more insight into the people who love God's law. Great peace have they which love thy law. Nothing shall by any means offend them. Isn't that something? The word gives us the remedy to deal with opposing forces, no matter where they come. If I love the law, the word of God, I have great peace. And my peace becomes a weapon against the enemy to silence his voice. So great peace have they who love thy law. Nothing shall by any means offend them. Only if I allow the word of God to be pliable in my heart. The word is pliable in my heart. I can allow the word of God to change my heart. Verse 3 of Psalms chapter 1 finally describes the destiny of such a person. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water and bring forth his fruit in his season whose leaves shall not wither and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Why? Because I love the law. I love the word of God. I love the Lord. I walk in obedience to the Holy Spirit. I allow him to lead God and direct me in the way of truth and righteousness. 
So my actions is a response to the love of God. If I love God, I'm going to love his law. If I love his law, I'm going to be obedient to his word. If I be obedient to his word, I'm going to follow the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit going to lead God and direct me in the pathway I need to go that I can flourish. In my season. There's a season. I'm going to end with this point. There's a season in our lives where we feel like God is silence. We feel barren. Don't seem like we're going to bear any fruit in our lives. Don't seem like the ministry is going to get off the ground. We feel like no matter what I do, nothing seems to work out the way I need it to work out. Sometimes we have dry seasons. But in that dry season is a time you need to plug in the most. When you devote your time and your attention span on the Word of God and allow the Word of God to get right here in your heart and in your mind. And that Word will encourage you in your dry season to keep rejoicing in the Lord and be exceedingly glad for grace and reward in heaven. Allow the Lord God to be that water in your life to replenish you, to refresh you, to build you. Bless the day who hunger and thirst after what? Righteousness. They shall be filled. In your dry season, they shall be be filled. If you allow the Holy Spirit to convict your heart, to change your life, you shall be filled. Only if you learn how to shut your mouth sometime and say, okay, God, I'm angry. I'm upset, God. I'm ready to retaliate. I want to take vengeance in my own hands, God, but I know it's not you, but God, help me. And guess what? A soft answer turns away wrath, but greed is worse than anger. Proverbs 15 and 1. And that's what God would tell you. Speak softly in the spirit. Don't allow your flesh to respond the way you want to respond. But when I respond in the leadership and it dictates the Holy Spirit, I'm going to speak a soft answer in accordance to the leadership of the Holy Spirit. And when I speak what God tells me to speak, it calms the savage beast. It silences the voice of the enemy. Even what calls the people coming against you to shut their mouth and leave you alone. Only when I walk in obedience and surrender to the Lord Jesus Christ, then God will come into my heart and change my life. We're going to uh, pick this up next week, the rest of this, this part of the chapter, uh, planted, the plant that flourishes, the plant that flourishes. We'll finish this next week. But I pray that something has been said tonight that encourages you. Because we all need that encouragement. We all get out of character sometimes. Sometimes we get stingy. Sometimes we get selfish. We know a brother sister have a need. We don't want to help them. And they, they, they tell you what they're going through. Instead of you helping them, you say, I'll pray for you. But you got means to help them. And you don't do it. God says, you're no good in the house of God. If you have a brother or sister in need and you can help them, he says, you're no good. Read in 1 John. I believe it's in chapter 5. It talks about that. I'll find it later. I'll put it on Facebook. Um, but I tell you, when you walk in obedience and you give to help somebody else, I'm a living witness. It comes back to me every time. Because I told the Lord, whatever thy will is, let thy will be done. Even in my money, let your will be done. You know what? I have not lost a thing. I always keep getting blessed. Everything I need, God keeps providing. Why? Because I trust in the Lord with all my heart, my soul, my mind, my will, and my strength. And I tell God, God, if anybody I can help that need help, if I'm able to do it, God, help me to do it. And guess what? He does that. I help people all the time. And I tell you, when you start having that type of attitude, the Lord don't mind blessing you. But you have a selfish attitude and a stingy heart, guess what? You cut yourself off. That's what God told the church in, 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 in the book of Amos. He says, he said, consider your ways. So why did my house lie empty? Your house is full. He said, that's why I blew on your money. He said, you, you, you gain, but you ended with little. As a matter of fact, you put it in a bag, and it's like you put it in a pocket with holes. 
Why? Because I'm blue on it because of your selfishness. So we got to get to the place where we say, God, I want to live right for you in every area of my life. And God, I want to thank you that I have a heart to obey your word and do what you tell me to do according to your word. Amen. Amen. So we're going to close right here. So Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this lesson now, God. I pray that you help somebody on their journey, oh God, and that they will flourish in the house of God, to begin to grow, Father God, in their, their calling on their life, their purpose, the plan you have for their life, that you strengthen them, oh God, in their weakness that they have, oh God, the struggles and the habits and addictions that seem to have them in grip, oh God, that you break the vice grips tonight. Break it, God. Break the chains and the shackles. Set them free in their inner man, oh God, that they'll have no more excuses to hold on to their habit. And I thank you, Lord God, for the Holy Spirit to come in like a mighty flood, oh God, begin to wash their minds and their hearts, oh God, from filthiness and a sinful conscience. That they have the mind of Christ to begin to flourish in the house of our God. That they be like the trees planted by the rivers of waters and begin to prosper in their season. And I thank you for it, God, in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. I pray this lesson helps somebody tonight. And if you want to sow a seed, I put the link on here. It's on here each week. Um, we can sow a seed to my cash out. And wherever seed goes for the materials and also goes back into the church too. So um, if you want to sow a seed, feel free to sow a seed. Whatever God put in, put them out, he put in your heart. If it's $5, a dollar, it doesn't matter what it is. Whatever seed you sow is for the kingdom, to building of God's kingdom. And I just pray that you walk in obedience. If God put in your heart to sow a seed, don't rebel. You cut your own blessing off by being rebellious. And then also tonight, if you don't know Jesus, your Lord and Savior, the Bible tells us, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. You might be a Christian, but you backslid. You walked away from God. You got stuck in a habit, in a bad habit, in a bad addiction. You can't seem to break free. I want you to pray this simple prayer with me tonight. For the Bible says, with the mouth confession is made, with the heart man believes unto righteousness. And I tell you what, when you do this, do with expectation that God will begin to restore you, to revive you, to fill you with the Holy Spirit, and change your mind and your heart. And I guarantee God will do that. So I want everyone to repeat after me, if you will, tonight. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, just lift those hands wherever you are. Lift your hands. Begin to surrender to the Lord. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, I lift my hands before you, God. I acknowledge I have a sin issue in my life. And I ask you to forgive me for my sins, knowing unknowingly, come into my heart and cleanse me, God. Change my mind, change my attitude, change my life, oh God, and be my Lord and Savior. I ask you to come into my heart tonight, oh God, and fill with the Holy Spirit. That I will be a witness for you. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, and you are a backslider, or you're a person just just said that prayer for the first time in your life, the host of heaven is rejoicing over you because you made a righteous choice to give your life to the Lord. And I guarantee from this day forward, you're going to receive challenges, but you're going to find strength and grace from the Holy Spirit to overcome. Because the more you learn about God and your identity in Christ Jesus, the better and better you become in the kingdom of God. Jesus told disciples, that people going to come saying the kingdom of God is over there, is over there, is over there. So he said, but lo, the kingdom of God is within you. And the kingdom of God is God's ruling government authority that rules in your heart, your mind, your soul, your will, and your emotions. That you will live a surrendered life to the glory of God. So again, I want to thank everyone for joining us tonight. Next week, we will be at our church. We're going to do that every other week, every other Tuesday. We will be having a live stream from the church. And then the opposite Tuesdays, I'll be doing it from my house. So I just pray that you're being blessed by these teachers. Allow the Holy Ghost to continue to empower you. Study the Word. Study the Word. I saw another book. I didn't find this book anymore. I'm just trying to find it so I can tell people to get this book. But I can't find this book anymore. But there's another book by the same author talking about breaking habits. And I tell you, when you get this book, the Holy Spirit, oh my God, he will come into your life. He will help you to be set free from the stronghold, the snares, and the noise and enemy. And the Spirit of God will fill you 
like you've never been filled before. And I tell you, it's an awesome thing. And if you don't have a book, The Bait of Satan, get the book, The Bait of Satan. Even in the Kindle version, I have the Kindle version of The Bait of Satan, Living Free from Deadly Traps of Offense. Get that book. That book will liberate you. Because the more you study this book, that's what I teach each week from each chapter. I'm taking step by step each chapter, and I'm defining it and breaking it down where you can understand it and apply it to your heart. And I pray that it becomes enlightenment and enriching to your spirit, man, to cause you to grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Holy Ghost. And I tell you, when you do, God will come into your life and change your life for the better. You all have a blessed night. Lord said the same. We'll resume again on next week, Tuesday. At Redeemed Faith Fellowship Church, we're streaming live. If you're in the, in the local area of Milwaukee, you can join us at 3223 West Lloyd Street. 3223 West Lloyd Street, Milwaukee, Wisconsin. You can join us at 6 o'clock on next week, Tuesday, if you're in the Milwaukee area, for our weekly Bible class. And I look forward to hearing and seeing from you all. God bless you. Shalom. Peace be unto you. In Jesus' name, good night. Oh, also, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to inbox me. Inbox me your questions, and I'll make sure I answer those questions in a timely order. All right, God bless you. Have a great night.